Yes. My lords, my lady, I represent the appellant um, who sits behind me with my instructing solicitor, Ms. Thea Thanis. Mr. Squire represents the first respondent, the local authority, and he is due, joined by his pupil, Mr. Beck, who sits behind him. Ms. Krishna represents the mother. My own friend, Ms. Hughes, represents the children, and she is joined by her pupil, Ms. Mallon. Um, I apologise in advance that the bundle for this matter was lodged slightly late. Um, there were last minute amendments. Don't worry. And, um, the agreed note, which is contained within the bundle, has been approved by the learned recorder. Right. And we now have a transcript which should have been filed and served of the judgment. Oh, okay. Um, it's very similar to the agreed note. Um, is this what's just come up? Is this what we've got? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last document filed and served last week. Um, in terms of my approach, I was going to address each of my grounds and my learned friend's responses to them as outlined in their skeleton arguments. Yes. Um, ground one, um, in my submission, is the key ground in this case. And I don't think the law is controversial. There is no dispute that the learned recorder identified the correct test. Um, my submission is that it didn't attach weight um, to key features and did not put into the scales um, those points in favour of joinder. I outline those in detail in my skeleton argument. Um, but in summary, the appellant had lived with the child for the majority of the child's life and taken on a parental role for him. The child was living with the appellant as an approved carer for four months up until his removal on the 4th of August, at a hearing in which the appellant was not invited to. The viability and special <coughs> guardianship assessments identified that the appellant had a close connection to the child. Can we just pause on the, um, the removal? Um, we've obviously only got a selection of the papers because we don't have the papers within the care proceedings. Um, in, in normal circumstances, um, would there not be an obligation to give notice uh, before a removal pursuant to a change of a care plan? Certainly, my lord, that would be my expectation. Um, I don't understand... Well, it's not, it's not just an expectation. Isn't there a, um, an understood principle that goes back to the um, decision in, in DE um, that you get notice before, um, before removal unless there's um, an urgency in the matter? I appreciate we're not here on an appeal from that order. Um, um, and you will know very little about it. My Lord, I, I know nothing about it. I haven't, I've not had sight of the care um, papers and the care proceedings. Was any explanation ever provided as to why, how and why that took place? Or why it took place? No, my Lord. All I'm aware of is that um, the appellant was telephoned when he was at work and told that the child would be removed from his care and that would take place straight from nursery. They wouldn't have an opportunity to say goodbye, and then the appellant wasn't invited to the hearing. He received, I think, from the mother um, an email or a text message stating that there would be a hearing, um, but he wasn't invited to attend or given full information by the local authority. Okay. All right. Um, in terms Sorry. of the assessments that have been undertaken, there was a, a viability and a, a special guardianship assessment which was negative. Um, but within those, and I do quote them in the skeleton, there, there were numerous positives outlined about the appellant and about his relationship with the child, and I think importantly in this case is that the child is severely autistic, and what was identified by the assessors in both those assessments was that um, the appellant was able to meet his needs and had a good relationship with him, and um, I think that's also noted um, in the contact notes that um, have been, we've received since that hearing, that the child continues to have a, a good relationship, and there's, and in the viability it was described in fact as, as a wonderful relationship was observed between the two of them. As to Conte, has that continued? Yes, my lady. Uh, once a month for an hour and a half. Um, Mr. Britton's attended all sessions that have been offered. And we've got the contact notes of two of those sessions, but we, not, we haven't been sent the third for November. In my submission, the learning recorder did not factor in um, those very significant matters um, when considering um, the test and whether um, the appellant had an arguable case um, in terms of potentially caring for the child or indeed having another role in the child's life. Um, he didn't um, uh, quote any of the, of the positive points outlined in those assessments. Um, he noted uh, the role the appellant had played in the sense of being a father figure, but didn't seem to go into any further detail about that. Um, in my submission, he, he focused solely 
or heavily on the untested, mostly untested allegations or safeguarding concerns that had been raised about the appellants. Um, to the extent that he said there was no really good reason for the appellant to even be applying um, to be a party. Um, he considered him to potentially have an ulterior motive. And in my submission, based on the history of this child living with the appellant for the majority of his life, um, in my submission, it was perverse for the, for the learned recorder to have considered there to be no good reason um, for the appellant to want to be involved in the decisions made um, for this little boy, and also um, that the appellant wouldn't have something to offer the court in terms of knowing the child um, and being able to assist in that respect as well. Um, in terms of the, uh, the negatives, I'll call them, or the safeguarding concerns which um, were identified, um, the only established matter, um, I call it that, was the conviction for battery from 2014. What's curious about this is that in the viability assessment, there's a note that they've got the PNC, and it's described within that as a caution, and the appellant talks at length about that particular incident. Um, it's unclear as to whether he was directly asked whether that was a conviction or a, or a caution, but certainly in the special guardianship assessment, they've established then that it was a conviction, and that seems to have formed one of the concerns of the professionals as to why uh, the appellant... Was it suggested that they were different matters? I'm not clear, my lord. Um, I think they were... I think they are the same matter arising out of the same relationship at the same time. It's 2014, yes. January of 2014, I believe. Well, I have the pages. That, I mean, we needn't go to them, but just for, for reference, the pages seem to be 95 and 147 um, are the, um, the two references. And they're obviously very similar in time. And yes. it wasn't clear whether it was being suggested that there was more than one or whether it was a misdescription of one. Precisely, my lord. I'm not clear as to that. Um, but somewhere, I think, in the viability, the appellate does state that he thought there was more related to that relationship, more cautions, potentially. That's um, what's recorded. As, mm. I, as I understand it, and I have to confess, I didn't find it the easiest to identify the exact details. There seems to be um, a conviction for assault, uh, for battery, in 2014, January. And there's an earlier conviction. Yes. of a different nature, but yes. there's an earlier conviction. And insofar as there appears to be something else, there may be convictions, I beg your pardon, cautions, but again, the details were less than clear. Yes, my lord. Aside from that matter, um, the conviction, um, the other concerns um, were disputed by the appellant and were not explored, and I think this is where... Um, but ground three is relevant. Um, the learned recorder seems to have proceeded on the basis that, whilst describing them as concerns, he seems to have proceeded on the basis that those were established. Um, it was certainly the case in my submission that they could be um, realistically challenged. Um, the first concern being that the appellant was misleading professionals in some way. I cannot see that that was explored with the appellant in the assessments. Um, he seems, in my submission, to have been open in both assessments regarding his criminal history, but also regarding his mental health, which was deemed to be a concern. Um, he just described having to go on antidepressants um, when asked by the assessor, and that was some time previously. I think it was also during 2014, during the difficulties that um, led to the conviction and the caution. Um, the other matters, um, and in my submission, not being clear, but I think may have been the matter that led to the removal of the child from the appellant's care, was probably the allegation made by the mother of the attempted strangulation five years earlier, which she made um, after the viability and before the special guardianship assessment was concluded. That is disputed by the appellant. Well, can you just help us to dates? Because again, I'd be grateful for clarification, but it was my understanding from reading that she made that allegation in June. Yes. And the removal is August. Yes. 22nd of June. I'm not clear as to why there was a delay in, in, in the room, or whether there were other factors. Um, it just seems that that was the most striking change from the viability to the uh, decision to remove. Um, the viability, which I say, was, was glowing in terms of the appellant and his care of Michael. Um, but obviously that matter is disputed, and um, the circumstances have to be borne in mind that the mother previously had wanted the child to live with the appellant, and that was in part why he was placed with him, and he'd always had a significant role in the child's life up until that point. And the mother, of course, was um, going through mental health difficulties at that time. Um, and obviously, the allegation was alleged to have, the incident was alleged to have taken place five years earlier. Um, 
The other matter, which seems to have been uh, raised at the hearing, relates to uh, suggestions of the appellant being controlling and coercive or, or having some um, attempt to control the mother over a will. Again, I'm not clear as to the details of that, but I note they were raised at the hearing. And again, these are matters which are, are disputed by the appellant, and I can see no real, apart from them being raised as concerns, no evidential basis for that. Um, could you take us to any references in the papers that we have to do with either um, the will. Um, apart, uh, the, the, that, that is referenced in the um, special guardianship assessment, but there's no underlying material about that, is there? No. Okay. Um, and it's not, it's not particularly clear from, it isn't clear at all, the extent to which it's agreed that that happened but it said there was nothing wrong with it. Um, or it isn't agreed that it happened at all, but <clears throat> that's one thing. Is there any reference at all to attempts by your client to self-harm, apart from the fact that it appears in the special guardianship assessment? Is there any information that's provided, or is that supposed to be in redacted? All I've seen is what is in with the special guardianship. And it's not, so there's no reference to it at all? Self-harm, no. No. But that appears to have been another... Yes. Statement that is made but without there being any underlying information. Yes, my lord. Right. Now, <coughs> you, you weren't at the hearing before the recorder, um, but your client was represented. Yes. And it was a CBP hearing. Yes. Um, and what document? Um, the document that he had was the one that we've got, which is the redacted um, special guardianship I've been assessment. informed this morning by a letter from the local authority that he had the unredacted copy of the special guardianship assessment. Right, so that lies behind ground three, three. because um, it's not possible to know what is behind the redactions or what the purpose and theory behind the redacting has been. Indeed, my lord. Um, so in essence, um, my lords, my lady, that's ground one. Um, that in my submission, there was clearly an arguable case here. Um, all the positive factors were established. They weren't disputed. Um, the concerns um, were not tested. Um, and when weighing the factors, in my submission, the learned recorder fell on the wrong side of that. And his decision was wrong in law. There was an arguable case here. There was a good reason for him to be joined as a party. Um, an arguable case for what? Well, um, it would depend on um, the order that the appellant would be seeking. Um, I think the reason that the arguable case test has been established is because there's no point joining somebody to be a party if... I understand that, but we don't know, though we may find out, <coughs> what the state of the care proceedings is at the moment. Um, uh, we know there's a hearing on the 3rd of January. Um, we don't at this stage know what the party's positions is um, about that. Uh, but um, we, we, we are able to find out from, from you um, what your client's stance is. Uh, in other words, what's, what is he intervening in order to achieve? What's his, what's his purpose in being there? The appellant wants to, wants to have a role in caring for Michael. Um, I don't know the position with the mother and I don't think from reading the assessments the appellant has ever put himself in competition with the mother I think it's clear he says repeatedly that if she's well she should care for him however um, plainly he's had a role in bringing him up and he's considered to be a, the father of the child um, so the obvious would be a special guardianship order my lord that was what the, um, he was being assessed for and if the mother was not in a position to care that would be what he would be seeking or in but in second to that, possibly a child arrangements order or some other type of order. Right, so care under an SGO or theoretically a child arrangements order. Failing that? A high level of contact, might be. 
there would also be other options such as respite care for the mother if she if she was deemed in a position to care but needed support he, his role in, in this family's life from the outset had been providing support to the mother but not in competition no my lord right is that ground one that's ground one yes I mean, in terms of um, my responses to my own friend's um, skeleton arguments in respect of ground one, the local authority's first point is that the appellant should have applied for a special guardianship order, I think, um, at that hearing, rather than party status. Um, but I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. I think. And it's pointed out that even if he had applied for a special guardianship order, he wouldn't have um, been given leave for the same reasons as the judge did not make him a party. Um, but the point is the appellant was not simply seeking a special guardianship order. Um, he was seeking um, to be a party to challenge the negative assessments of him. Um, the issue of the removal of Michael was also relevant. And could we, could we sorry, sorry, just not mention the child's name? Sorry, sorry. The child. And also um, ongoing contact issues. Um, the special guardianship assessment was negative. Any application would have failed. It would be appropriate that Because it, my the, the special guardianship provisions explicitly bring in section 10.9 as the gateway to uh, being given permission to apply. Yes. So um, you say it doesn't help the local authority to say that's the application you should have made because we know what answer you would have got. Exactly. A circular argument in my submission, my lord. Um, this was the proper application and a special guardianship application could have been considered further down the line once um, we'd had sight of the papers and knew what was being um, advanced on each party's case and also what the evidence was um, against the appellant and in favour of him. Um, and the second part of uh, the local authority's response to ground one um, is in essence uh, what I've already outlined. Um, they say it was bound to fail any application by him and I say for the reasons I've already outlined it was not. Um, and by may I'll turn to ground two. Yes. Um, uh, and essentially, this is to a certain extent covered by ground one, but also by ground three, and it's to ensure there was a fair, fair determination um, of the issues in the case. Um, the issues being um, any application the appellate may make to care for the child, but also, I say, the removal of the child from his care. In my submission, that needed explanation as to what happened, as whether that was appropriate within the proceedings, um, and ongoing contact. These are all matters that, by not allowing the appellant party status, he could play no meaningful role in the proceedings. Um, and he did not have the evidence before him to, to make the appropriate challenges. Um, so my submission, there could not be a fair determin determination of the claims um, or the issues in the case. So is that really challenging the uh, approach that the recorder took to um, when considering what, what role your client could play? In other words, saying he can... Uh, was it? Are you, are you saying that? I'm not quite sure whether he did decide this. That, that the, your client could play a meaningful role in the way described in the judgment, and you're challenging that and saying he couldn't actually play a meaningful role. Yes, I think he, grounds two and grounds four are essentially the same. Yeah. Grounds four is the learned recorder suggested there were ways he could play a meaningful yeah. role, such as uh, putting in a statement or objecting to the uh, independent social work assessment. And I don't, in my submission, I think he couldn't really deny either of those things if he wasn't represented if he didn't have the evidence. I, I'm bound to say, when, when I first looked at this, and still I don't see that they're necessarily the same, I'd understood that ground two related to the fact that a decision was taken on the basis of redacted evidence. Yes, that's part of it. Um, and that that's the distinctive feature of, of ground two, because you don't know what the judge saw um, that, um, that you hadn't seen. Um, whereas ground four relates to what might be described as an internal inconsistency in the judgment, namely that he has no role to play, but he can come along and play it. Yes, my lord. Um, so I, I, that's my understanding of the of the way that your grounds. No, absolutely. Um, no, that, that's yes. Ground two is it's about the fairness, and it, it was it was it was dual. It was the, the fact that he couldn't play a meaningful role, so those issues couldn't be decided, and and he couldn't do that because he wasn't made a party and he didn't have the evidence in any event. So even at that hearing, he couldn't put forward any proper challenge. So there were, there were, 
appreciate because we're coming to ground three that the question of how much evidence was received, but were any statements before the court? Not that I'm aware of. Well, there will presumably have been a statement from the local authority in support of its removal application, uh, but you won't have seen that, and we haven't. Um, we don't know whether there were any statements from the mother, but none, none are referred to in the, no. in the text. And there wasn't a statement from your client, no, because he had no permission to file a statement. Right, so it, it's, it's often said that um, the court can make a decision, particularly a case management decision, on the basis of the written evidence. But coming to maybe it's ground two or maybe it's ground three, this is a case in which actually there wasn't any evidence at all, um, apart from the filed assessments. Indeed. From your client's perspective. Yes, my lord, and I think um, perhaps the misunderstanding of my ground three with my learned friends is that I was suggesting that that hearing should have been heard on evidence rather than submissions, which was the decision the advocates took. But it was more about the conclusions the judge reached at that hearing when he didn't have any evidence. It, it, these right, matters so, required inquiry. So you're, you're not complaining that there wasn't oral evidence? Not at that hearing, no. no. Um, I wasn't aware, but that was an agreement that was reached. But the, the issue for me is um, the, the judge made decisions um, on uh, untested allegations, which essentially it was, that was, it was finality of proceedings for the appellant, and those matters required inquiry within the proceedings because they were disputed matters. Um, so that's essentially ground three. Um, uh, to, the, to the extent that the learned recorder said that there was possibly an ulterior motive here based on these concerns, um, if he was going to make such decisions or such conclusions about that, he really needed to hear the evidence um, and to say that it could not be done on the very limited material he had in front of him at that hearing. That's really ground two, isn't it? You, I think you, they overlap. Against this history, you can't make a finding like that. Yes. Or you can't speculate in yes. that manner. Mm -hmm. And ground three perhaps crosses over, in fact, grounds one and two, um, rather than as a standalone. Um, in terms of the final ground, ground four, um, I think that I've already addressed this. Um, the learned judge was suggesting there were other ways in which the appellant could have some role, which were not realistic. Um, the only way for him to have a meaningful role was, was to be a party. Um, he wouldn't be represented. It's not clear how he would file a statement. In any event, the judge didn't give any, um, didn't make any directions for him to do so anyway. So it wasn't something that was going to be allowed at that hearing, and he would never have had representation again to have done it at any other hearing. Can, can you help us as to uh, what the position is in relation to eligibility for legal aid? Um, I think we can take it for granted that if you're, you're, if you're not in some sense a party, um, then you're not going to get legal aid. Um, is it the case that if you are um, added as a party but you're not a parent, so I don't qualify for automatic legal aid without means or merits testing. You have to make a means and merits case. Is that the, the situation? I'm told it is, my lord. Right. And um, is it thought, leave aside merits, that your client would qualify on means? Yes, because he gets it now, my lord, I'm told. Right. So are you? do you have legal aid for this? Yes. Did you have legal aid for the application yes, we did. before? Right, so the effect of... I, I don't want to um, presume this, but I am at the moment presuming that if your client doesn't have party status, that he will not have legal aid henceforth. That's my understanding. Well, could you? I, 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 there's somebody here who probably knows this extremely, extremely well. Are you able to take instructions about that? If I may turn my back for a moment. Yes, please. No, 
understanding is if he doesn't have any status in the proceedings, he wouldn't receive legal aid. If he was made an intervener, he could potentially receive legal aid. He made an application. Which yes, I understand, but you can be an intervener, yeah. a party for a special purpose. That, you think, would sustain the legal aid? It means a merit test of yes, my lord. But that's as, as at present? I mean. Yes. Um, whereas, at the moment, speaking for myself, I don't quite understand how, whether represented or not, um, your client could simply turn up um, on no. the 3rd of January. Um, no, I don't understand that. Um, any evidence in advance of that, he wouldn't. No one would. Yes. Okay. Um, so essentially, those are my grounds. In terms of um, the Guardian, the Skelton argument, and their comments about um, a delay in a pragmatic way forward. Um, uh, as to delay, obviously we accept that um, delay is not in the best interest of the child. I'm aware that there's an IRH listed in January. I'm not aware of any other dates within the. Um, care proceedings that have been listed. I don't know, for example, if there's a final hearing listed or what, out, uh, what assessments are outstanding. Um, but in my submission, in any event, what is essential is that the court can properly consider all of the options for the child um, and, this, and there must be a fair approach to the proceedings. And the fact that the appellant in my um, submission hasn't been a party means that there hasn't been a fair process because he should have been involved in challenging assessments, um, making any applications um, and providing evidence. So for that reason, um, inevitably, if he's joined as a party, there may be some delay. Um, but I submission that is necessary to ensure this case is dealt with fairly for the child. Um, and therefore, delay in this case would be in his interest. And I may just add that the delay is not the fault of the app appellant. Um, he made application for party status on the 18th of August, so, so very, very promptly. Um, and part of the reason, as I outlined um, in my skeleton, that was the reason to avoid any delay later in these proceedings. Um, the pragmatic way forward, suggested my learned friend, <coughs> is for the reasons I think we've already discussed, not. Um, would not provide fairness um, to the appellant. Um, it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, he couldn't practically challenge the SGO just by turning up as an individual. Uh, the negative SGO assessments, I mean, just by turning up. And also, the situation has now been unfortunately achieved where there isn't anybody who's available to facilitate him because the local authority, the mother and the guardian, yes. have all shut the door on him. Yes. If there's nobody... For, um, fighting his case, I suppose. There'd be nobody to call him or, or no advocate to cross-examine on his behalf. Um, so in my submission, that, that wouldn't really solve the problem. It may, in fact, create more difficulties at any hearing, um, which could cause even further delay than if it was made now. Um, in respect of the privacy point, which is raised, obviously the court has discretion as to what's disclosed, even if a person is a party, and they could withhold some documents. I don't see why it would be necessary for my client to have the entirety of the mother's medical records, for example. And that would have to be considered a case management hearing. But Certainly, the appellant would not want to um, have sight of documentation that wasn't relevant to the issues that he was pursuing and that the mother did not want released. Um, the other points raised by the Guardian include um, a suggestion that um, it's not known as the connection between the child and the appellant because of his limited language. In my submission, the assessments that we've seen and the contact notes show that's clearly not the case. There clearly is a positive uh, relationship observed by professionals, and it's positive in the sense that the appellant can also meet, my, uh, meet the child's uh, complex needs. Um, so that's my response to that point, and that's why I included the contact notes, even though they did not form part of the earlier hearing. Um, it's just because they were raised in that skeleton argument. Um, so my laws, my lady, those are my submissions on the appeal. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Squire. My Lord, my Lady, I appear on behalf of the uh, local authority who opposes this appeal, as you know. Um, in, in my submission, the starting point for the determination of, of this appeal is to identify, uh, as my Lord rightly asked, what it is uh, the appellant is seeking to achieve by his participation within these proceedings. And it's clear in my submission from his pleaded case um, before this court and the court below that uh, what he seeks to achieve is a special guardianship order in relation to the child. Well, is that fair? It depends. It, it, it does. It might be said that he's fighting in the dark, to use an <coughs> expression, because the, as you just heard, the case that he might seek to advance depends upon uh, what the competing contentions are in these substantive proceedings, which none of us know. Yes. When I say none of us, 
but obviously some people do know, but we don't know. Yes. And um, the appellant doesn't know. My Lord, I can help on that point if it assists. Um, I understand that there's been an agreed application uh, by those who are parties to the proceedings for the um, IRH listed in January to be adjourned uh, to allow a period of eight weeks of um, substantive work with the mother to um, support her with the intention of uh, the child possibly be returning to her care following further assessment. Wh wh which child? Uh, the, the child with whom uh, Mr Bidden is... Well, which, which, which work concern? The older child? Yes, yes. Right. Um, at the moment, um, I mean, can you just help us about some basic <coughs> facts? that we know that the mother was unfortunately hospitalised in April. At, at what point did the younger child leave her care? The younger child... Uh, my Lord, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. It's certainly something that I'd be able to find um, relatively easily. Well, somebody will yeah. know. Um, so... Uh, next question is the is the younger child still in foster care? Yes. Uh, my lord, my learned friend is helpfully assisting. It was the twenty second of April, twenty twenty two, when the younger child was removed from in, into foster care. Right, um, and presumably, and uh, there was then a point when when the mother herself was discharged from hospital. Yes. Um, that was anticipated in, in August. Did it in fact occur then? I, I think that's right. Uh, again, my lord, um, off the top of my head, I, I think that's right. But All I right, don't well, know the answer. you'll correct it during the course of the hearing if it isn't. Yes. Is anybody watching these proceedings? Yes, my. Uh, my social work team are, are watching these proceedings. Right, so they'll be able to give you instructions. Yes. Um, and you've now told us that um, it's likely that the hearing on the 3rd of January will go off. Yes. In order for there to be eight weeks work. Yes. To support with the with what program? Um, it's, it, it's a uh, program of teaching for the mother to help her achieve the skills necessary to be able to care for both of the children, um, one hopes, and then there'll be a further period of assessment thereafter. Right. And, sorry, thank you. So, obviously, everybody, and I do mean everybody, hopes that that will be successful and that the children will be able to return to yes. their mother's care and, um, and that represent a secure future for them. Um, uh, but inherent in any process of assessment is the possibility that that won't be the case. Yes. Um, which would obviously be regrettable. Um, but that leaves for um, uh, the younger child, obviously, the um, prospect of adoption, yes. given his age. Um, the older child, it leaves a choice between um, remaining in foster care or something else. Yes. Right. So w we appear to now have reached the point where, although the recorder wouldn't have known it, some form of intervention by the appellant in this case is not going to cause any delay. Yes, I have to. So delay that. has now gone yes. because of the particular circumstances. But his case, whether it be for special guardianship or for some lesser um, form of order is is only a fallback. Yes, is it not. But uh, on on the understanding that I've heard from my learned friends this morning, then yes, it seems to be he's not put, putting himself in competition yes. with, with the. Mother. Well, I mean, either either that's been obvious from the start, or it should have been established mm. at a much earlier stage. But let's take it at face value that it's a fallback and not a competitive application. Uh, what then is the merit in? striking somebody out um, if they have an arguable case. Clearly, I imagine you say there isn't any merit in that. And so it depends upon whether they have an arguable case to be a fallback, either carer 
or significant connected person? Uh, my Lord, yes. Um, this isn't a case where the local authorities say that there is any other good reason why Mr. Ridden shouldn't be able to um, participate if the court were to consider that there is an arguable case. Um, the, the dispute between the local authority and, and um, what the learned recorder identified is that there, there is no arguable case. Right. So it, it all now, for our purposes, turns upon <coughs> the question of whether it was proper for the local authority to say that he had no reasonable prospect of obtaining any, any order of any significance. Therefore, he has no role in the proceedings. Therefore, we can say goodbye to him now. But, um, my Lord, yes, um, save that the points that, that the procedural points that I make in my skeleton argument um, go also to the issue about uh, the subsequent participation of Mr. Gridden if he were. Um, I don't think we need to name him. I, I, I apologise, yes. the, the appellant. Yes. Um, if he were uh, to be involved in proceedings in, in one way or another. Yes, but that, that's a case management decision that uh, the judge could make. Could it, take. It, it is, my lord, a case management decision that the judge could make. Um, I, I make the point in my skeleton argument that the more appropriate application would be either for a special guardianship assessment or, or an application of section 34 for contact with the And child. then back you come to 10-9. Uh, I, I entirely accept that. So what's that. the, where's the candor in that suggestion? It's the issues which follow from um, the appropriate procedural application in my submission which make the difference. But um, it, I, as I identified and but my Lord makes the, the fair point that those are still matters that the learned judge could make as case management uh, questions. And, and, and so I, I make the point, I, I take it no further than I have. I interrupted you. Thank you. Um, my Lord, on the substance issue about whether the appellant has an arguable case. Um, the learned recorder had the benefit of the unredacted special guardianship assessment before him in reaching his decision. Um, I, I recognise that my lady and lord don't have a copy of that unredacted assessment today. Um, what I say about that is that there's clear power within uh, Part 12, uh, 18 of the Family Procedure Rules to allow for limitation in the disclosure of information up from a special guardianship report um, to parties or those subject to those reports. And it, it, in this particular case, um, it's my submission that it was, an appro it was appropriate for, for the appellant not to have seen the entirety of that document, uh, given the information which was contained within it. There's clearly um, a benefit within proceedings relating to the welfare of children for people to be able to provide information uh, without having fear of the repercussions of that information where they're third party. But is, is the, I don't want to pry inappropriately, but you're saying that this is for the protection of third parties? Yes. Uh, one third party in particular? Or more than one? More than one. Right? But in relation to somebody who I think has been referred to as A, Ms. A, um, in the papers that have been disclosed, yes. that's somebody that um, the appellant knows? It, it is. So what's being protected? Well, the, the, the content of the information um, may, if disclosed to the appellant, lead to repercussions towards uh, A and the others who have provided that information. Uh, it, it is alleged, and I accept to some degree this is disputed by the appellant, that that was a volatile relationship um, with uh, a, a, a domestically abusive relationship. And indeed, my Lord and Lady, uh, we have, we know that there were convictions rising out of that relationship as a result of um, alleged battery. So it's one. Not convictions, plural. Well, um, my lady, I've been able to uh, <coughs> see the PNC from which the information was taken in relation to the special guardianship assessment, and if it would assist um, to provide that clarity which my lady sought earlier, uh, there was a conviction in 
1996, albeit from a different relationship, which uh, related to damaging the property and sending a letter or other article um, conveying a threat. There was then a caution on the 15th of August 2013, which I think on the timeline must have been during the relationship with um, A. And then there was a conviction on the 21st of January 2014 uh, for battery. And it's that conviction, <coughs> my lady, which led to the restraining order and the community order passed, which is referred to within the special guardianship assessment. Well, what the... Um, this was known in the assessment under Re Regulation 24. Um, because if you look at page 95 of the bundle, that's what... Um, that's what came up on the PMC check. My Lord, what we see at page um, 94, if I can pull it, check. 95. My apologies, 95. Um, Are is, you looking at page 95? Yes. Is, is the, um, there's a reference to a caution for assault, which, of course, uh, is... of a different nature to a conviction. And I understand that the information that came, which led to that error in recording, came from the police at the time. The local authority hadn't seen the full PNC at that time. And <coughs> a caution would uh, identify some acceptance of the, uh, the behavior, um, although Well, if you, if, you, if, you, if you go down to the next box, social care history shows that your authority were on the ground at the time of these events. And one can see matters that appear to be tracking the convictions and showing SC assessment completed, case closed, no further action. Yes. So I'm, I'm at the moment not grasping why this came as such a thunderclap to your authority um, conducting the special guardianship assessment. I appreciate the difference between a caution and a conviction, but that information didn't come from <coughs> the appellant. It came from official sources. It did, um, my lord. I think the why is, he, why is he being blamed for it? But m my lord, he's certainly not being blamed for um, the incorrect information. But what we see from the actual assess the, the special guardianship assessment is his um, responses to those issues at the time of that assessment. So at page one four six of the bundle, we see. We see uh, at the final paragraph of that page uh, analysis of how Mr. The, how the appellant addresses issues in discussion with the assessor, which shows that he was, in my submission, minimising the consequences of those. And over the page at one four seven, we see uh, that the appellant. It, it says that the appellant presents himself as a victim of his domestic within the relationship um, despite the fact that he received convictions in relation to two of his intimate partners we also know that there was subsequently an allegation made by the mother Sorry, can I just I, I've missed this two convictions in relation to two partners yes so the, the, the 96 conviction yes. which was of a, of a domestic nature and then the 2014 conviction and uh, the 2013 caution. And what we also know from the assessment is that Ms. Ms. Uh, the appellant says himself um, that he expected that there would be more cautions arising from the relationship with A, which shows, uh, in my submission, right. 
So the situation that's been reached is that everybody knows that the 13, 14 um, police involvement is to do with Miss A. Yes. Who I think uh, there was a marriage and there was a child. Yes. With stepchildren. Yes. And the, the local authority has put forward and, and, and the court has received information from Miss A that the appellant is not permitted to see. Yes. The, the court certainly has seen the information, uh, sorry, the court below had the benefit of seeing the information from Miss A which was contained in the special guardianship assessment. And so that was information which the learned recorder had before him. How does one know the basis upon which he reached his conclusion? My lord, we have his, of course we have his judgment, and in his judgment the recorder, in my submission, properly identifies the factors which he has to consider in making the determination. But they don't go beyond what, what is known to us. M m my lord, quite. I mean, there's nothing... The, the recorder has not said, for example, in the peculiar circumstance of this case, I've had to consider information that I can't share. Yes. And that gets it over the line to show that this case is not arguable, that there's no role to play. In fact, his conclusion on the face of it doesn't depend at all on withheld information. No. Uh, uh, and um, in my submission, one can properly rely upon the recorder to have, have identified the information which did was in his mind when he was making his judgment. Uh, and so there's, there, uh, the prejudice to the appellant uh, falls away because we can identify right, that. So you're prepared to argue it on the basis that the matters that are in the redacted parts which the appellant hasn't seen effectively add nothing to the information that he was allowed to see? On the basis of the recorder's judgment, it, it, it doesn't appear that he had taken that information into account in reaching the decision which he reached on the uh, substantive issue of the whether the appellant had an arguable case. Okay. Right. Would you, do you want to say anything about the... Um, sorry. Uh, no, 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 you carry on. Um, about the removal and, 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 and compliance <coughs> with... Um, Re-D-E. My Lord, Re-D-E was um, a case which, w which was about the appropriateness of a removal of a child who had been placed at home um, under a care order. In my submission, this is a separate situation because uh, the case here is, mis is the appellant was a Regulation 24 foster carer rather than uh, one who holds parental responsibility for uh, the child who was placed. You say DE doesn't apply to people who are carers um, at all. Uh, it only applies to parents. Is that the submission? My, my lord, I don't. I certainly don't go that far. Uh, the the case of DE makes clear that there has to be a balance between the Article Eight and Six rights. So, what was the what what was the urgency about that, that meant that the child had to be removed without um, any notice to the carer? My Lord, the information which um, led to that uh, removal arose from the discussions with the third parties, which is redacted within the special guardianship report. And it wasn't, uh, a, a, as my learned friend suggested, um, the, the allegation by the mother. It arose during the investigation. It was information which uh, came to light during the investigation of the, of the special guardianship assessment. And so that information was before uh, the <coughs> circuit judge who made the decision on the change of care plan. Who was the judge? Uh, 
hundred hertz. So the allegations that led to the without notice removal were made when? They, there was a statement before the court which is dated the 1st of August and the decision and of the circuit judge is dated the 4th of August. Yes, the statement is presumably a social work statement. A social work statement. Yes, now I was talking about the allegations by Miss A that you say were the trigger for removal. So those allegations were made initially to the um, the, the special guardianship assessor um, on in fact my lord I don't have that date it's not contained within the document social workers provide me that information during the course of the hearing. Right. <laughs> My Lord, if I can just um, expand upon the point in relation to VDE. Um, I, I certainly don't go as far as to say that it can never apply to a uh, person who's caring for a child subject to Regulation 24 or the uh, regulations in relation to foster care. But there is, in my submission, a difference between a child being placed in the care of someone who has parental responsibility, albeit subject to a care order, compared to a foster carer. I, I, I acknowledge that there's a, a large um, divide between the two, and one, for example, could be a foster carer who's look, looked after the child for a very short period of time. <coughs> Whereas in this case, we have the appellant who, who does have an established relationship. Um, I, I simply make that point. I, I don't know the reasoning of the circuit judge for not adjourning to give notice to the appellant, for example. Um, I've not seen any judgment from the, from that decision. The guardian was away? Pardon? The guardian was away? Yes. Although I, I understand the, uh, and I'm sure I'll be correct if I'm wrong, that the guardian had considered the application and, and um, supported that application. That appears to be the information from the uh, scale of an argument on behalf of my learned friend for the guardian. For some completeness, is there a um, where is the reference to self-harm on the part of the um, appellant? My Lord, that uh, information came from the GP report, which was received after the completion of the special guardianship assessment. And so um, I, I acknowledge that it's not dealt with within that assessment, but the information was before the uh, learned recorder below. And what, at what date was this... Um Said to have occurred. Sorry, I received this information during the course of the hearing, my lord. was in 1997 and one was in 2015, June of 2015. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, m my Lord, the final point that I, I make uh, by way of closing with us is that, of course, uh, discretionary decisions of, of a judge should um, not likely be interfered with by this court, 
um, albeit certainly uh, I acknowledge that the learned recorded judgment could have been more fully reasoned. It, it is in my submission um, right to acknowledge that he identified the test which he had to apply. He certainly uh, identified in the second paragraph the significant relationship which the appellant had with the child. Uh, that's contained at page 87 of the bundle. And so it was clearly in his mind that there was this significant relationship uh, between the child and <coughs> the appellant. And he had the benefit of consideration of the issues which have been aired during this hearing. Uh, and the benefit of the expertise of the guardian who herself his who himself had, had applied <coughs> his own opinion to these matters and reached the same conclusion that the local authority reached. And so in, in those circumstances, uh, my lord and lady I invite you to dismiss this appeal. Thank you. I'm sorry, no, I'm oh, sorry, yes. Wait a minute. And understood what you say about um, where that leaves the appellant. It leaves him in a position where he continues to have contact with the child um, on the terms uh, agreed by the local authority, so he continues to have some relationship with the child. Well, on terms, to be fair, are dictated by the local authority. When the the local 20, 24 hour a day care for four months and 90 minutes a month presumably not set in discussion with him I, I don't know the answer to that my lord um, but the local authority hold a care order and so the decisions in relation to contact are, um, are ones granted by parliament to the local authority subject to the oversight of the court uh, certainly right so what what for example um, can he do um, if he's dissatisfied with the level of contact? He could make an application under Section 34 of the Children Act for um, a, a decision by the court on contact with the child in care. Yes. And he needs permission to do that. He, he, he does, um, which of course comes back to the central point in, in this case whether the recorder was right or wrong to refuse yes. that permission. Right, so that, that takes us back to the same point. Um, and what about... Um, the suggestion um, that he can simply um, come along and, um, as the recorder put it, challenge the special guardianship assessment, apply for an independent assessment, file a statement or both. My Lord, um, I, I concede that uh, without directions of the court, there is no proper mechanism for him to be able to do that. And so um, if my lady and lords consider that he should be able to participate in those proceedings, um, the court could make directions today for him to file a statement of evidence setting out the issues which he challenges within the special guardianship assessment and his proposals for care for the child in the future and give permission on a limited basis for him to attend uh, any future hearings to ad address those issues. In, the, in a sense, trying to step back from this, um, what, what is the, as one looks at it now, what is the downside to that? Um, is it not a way of gathering further information for the benefit of the older child? Um, whether, the, whether the information is positive or negative so far as the appellant is concerned. The court would at least know what it was dealing with um, rather than in a sense having to deal with it with the door shut um, to somebody who was on any view a significant um, person for this little boy. And, and I'm not grasping but giving you the opportunity to deal with them. What's, what's the problem with, 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 with that um, approach? My Lord, I don't, it's never been the local authority's position um, that more information would be 
<coughs> in any way um, disadvantageous to uh, the children in this case. The concern has been the impact that party status would have um, given the plethora of, of information that comes with it, um, the, all of the information in relation to the mother trying to protect her, the, the information in relation to uh, those who have contributed to the special guardianship assessment. Uh, and that's why the position, as I understand it, was advanced at the hearing below, that there could be those mechanisms to participate. I, I accept that um, the there ought to have been more thought to how those mechanisms could be achieved through way of uh, direction to allow that participation. Um, but the the issue that the local authority takes is with joinder as a party to these proceedings. As I say, there are other mechanisms which mean he, he the appellant wouldn't be a party what, to What mechanism would that be? Uh, through the separate applications, uh, as I say, for a special guardianship order, which would allow him to be a party to separate proceedings. Uh, uh, my Lord, I, I'm, I'm but concerned I think that I'm making a circular... Yes, as you said, that comes back to arguable case, yes. and that's that's the problem, as my Lord, I think, is, is identifying, but in paragraphs 18 and 19 of the transcript of the judgment, is the, the judge is saying uh, there is a means by which he could play a role uh, but you're saying they all depend on him having an arguable case yes. because if he comes along and makes an, makes an application to challenge the special guardianship I still haven't quite worked out how he does that when he's uh, not part of the proceedings but say that he can challenge it then someone will say well on what basis what, what's your case Why, for what, what's your purpose of challenging it now you haven't got an arguable case so you're back where you started from but, my lord I am so, and, and so paragraph 19 offers something which isn't actually being offered. Yes, uh, and and I um, accept that uh, to, to, to that extent there, there was no mechanism built into the learned recorder's decision to allow him to play that role yeah. that the learned recorder... But wouldn't it be inconsistent if the record, learned recorder had said, I am going to allow you, I don't think you have an arguable case, but I'm going to allow you to challenge the special guardianship what, for the purposes of seeing where you have, whether you have an arguable case? Or what? Well, that... Um... And frankly, all this is being debated theoretically. What is the information in the case? What is the detail of the case? How do you challenge a case when you don't actually know what it is? My Lord, I, I, I take the point. Um, the question though then arises as to um, whether it was appropriate for the assessment to be redacted because that's what prevents uh, the appellant from having seen the entirety of the case. Um, certainly that wasn't an issue addressed in any detail as I understand it at court below. Um, no, I, answer, you're, you, I think you've said in answer to my Lord that the, that you're saying that we, we are able to determine whether the learning recorder's decision was right because we can take it. He didn't rely on anything in support of his decision that has been redacted. Mm. Um, but it's, I'm moving on from that. Is the suggestion in paragraph 19 that the appellant can challenge the special guardianship assessment? And what I'm asking is how do you challenge something when vast swathes of it have been redacted? That's, so what I'm saying is, you're, it, it's create it, it's creating a, a false um, route. A cul-de-sac. Yes, um, m my lord, I I agree that the points made by the recorder that there was mechanism to challenge those issues all come in my solution come back to the question of whether there was an arguable case. If there was no arguable case, then permission wouldn't be granted for any, any of application. Right. And okay. so the appeal in my submission could fall away on that basis. If my lady and lord consider that there was an arguable case and the judge was wrong on that point, then uh, the next stage is to consider what the mechanism is to allow Mr. Uh, the appellant to be involved in the proceedings, um, uh, 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 and that comes back to the 
central point, which is what his case is, whether he wants a special guardianship, a, a special guardianship order, or he's looking for contact with a child, or maybe both, um, or a mixture of those things. Uh, and when the central issue, which is before my lady and lords, has been determined about the reasonable prospects of succeeding, then those questions of direction moving forward for if you're against me on the point of the reasonable prospects of succeeding, then the, the direction ought to be considered. Yeah. No it, 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 it strikes me that if, because obviously we've only heard as it were, half the, the argument so far, um, that if um, the conclusion was that um, the appellant should have some standing, um, then probably the 3rd of January hearing is tailor-made for deciding exactly what the parameters of his standing are, yes. exactly whether there needed to be a redaction, because that's something that only a, a judge who actually has um, redacted and unredacted additions can say. Yes. At the moment, you say little was, um, was said about that, but for, for our purposes, it doesn't appear that it was consider mm. considered at all. No. Um, as to what the fairness issues were arising out of this, and we, we have to deal with it on the sensible basis that you suggested. But, I mean, we, we could only either say, well, this appeal fails, in which case the proceedings go on their way as they are, um, or the appeal succeeds, in which case the family court needs to get to grips with what the parameters uh, ought to be, so it seems to me. But um, you, you haven't yet said that the hearing on the 3rd of January has been lost. No. <coughs> no, I understand that um, a consent order has been filed, but we've not, in fact, heard from the court yet about whether that hearing has been vacated. Can I just ask, what, this arguable case yes. um, approach, uh, probably my ignorance, where does that come from? Uh, that is uh, from Lady Justice Black in the case of uh, we... Does she use that expression? I'm sorry, I'm, I, I may have um, misquoted the exact expression. Well, I think, I think I can help to this extent, that, that it's the 10-9 approach, which is, not a, is just a list of factors. And one of the things Lady Justice Black says is, um, is that the courts are obviously going to want to think about what the prospects of success are. But it, when we've been talking about arguable case, that's simply a label yes. for that process. So you, yes, it, quite. Because I thought you were turning that into the, the test that you have to... De okay. Uh, uh, because absolutely at 37, paragraph 37 of that judgment, as quoted in paragraph 17 of the recorder's judgment, does not say that. No. It's um, a broader analysis. Yeah. And that's the test that ought to be applied. I, I apologise. Okay. No, it's all right. Don't worry. Um, it, it's considering <coughs> the factors set out in 10.9 as well as the additional points made by... Yes, Lady because the, the, the way uh, Lady Justice Black um, put it was uh, you have to look beyond and no point in joining somebody if they would inevitably refuse leave to bring an application and would have no other legitimate role. So it's a broad analysis as to, uh, I f I'm focusing on the word legitimate role, the legitimate role in the proceedings. That's why you don't uh, join uh, grandparents when they're saying, if, if you know, we're a fallback or yeah. in some circumstances. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad analysis. It, it certainly is a broad analysis. And the nature of the case, the strength of the case, is part of it. Yes. Uh, as well as the other factors and um, specifically but the, the expression she used was inevitably ref be refused leave which is at one pretty uh, far end of the spectrum uh, of course it's that's at the far end of the, the spectrum because that closes the door on, on exactly and you don't you, you quite you need to be careful about when you close the door I, I certainly accept um, that point and uh, my central submission that is that in this case on these facts known by the recorder it was an appropriate decision. Right, thank you. Thank you. Anything? Yes, it, yes. My Lords, my Lady, I appear on behalf of the mother. Um, the mother, as you may have uh, deciphered from the papers, is a vulnerable woman. 
she is assisted in these proceedings not only by an interpreter, um, she's of, of Polish background, but also by Kamina Korf. She has an intermediary that assists her throughout these proceedings. There has been um, a cognitive assessment of her in these proceedings, um, albeit it's not filed within the bundle. And I'll, she, I'll simply summarise, she is somebody who is intellect, intellectually impaired um, with her level of functioning, means that she's likely to have significant difficulties with her cognitive abilities. She's likely to struggle to understand long, complex instructions. Written work may be very time-consuming for <coughs> her, and it may take her a long time to write. So she is considered vulnerable within these proceedings, as is the child. Um, my lords and my ladies, the position in relation to the 4th of August, I have not uh, previously represented my client in these proceedings, is that the local authority filed a redacted statement. The uh, reason, that, and my instructing solicitor sent me uh, that statement this morning on request, the reason um, <coughs> for the application was on the basis of the information that came from the DBS of the appellant and from the information that came from the interviews as part of the SBO assessment namely in relation to his ex-partner. So that statement is redacted. However... So redacted <coughs> as provided to your client? My client. And in fact, and I take the point made by uh, my learned friend, but in fact the <coughs> notice provision would apply, of course, to those with parental responsibility. But the local authority didn't... Um, their reasons for not notifying the appellant were not that he didn't have parental responsibility. Um, at the end of the statement, makes clear um, that Mr. <coughs> the appellant is not yet aware of the local authority's concern, as it is felt this would increase his stress levels and the risk he presents. Therefore, it has not been possible to engage him in the safety planning. My client uh, was given uh, limited notice of the uh, interim care order hearing with a bridge time for service on the basis they were concerned she may alert him. Um, so I hope that assists in that regard. Right, I see. Thank you. Um, in relation to the hearing, the issues resolution hearing that is listed on the 3rd of January, my understanding, and I'm not clear, we don't have all the orders, is that the standard directions when one is directing a special guardianship order assessment is that there's provision that in the event the assessment is negative, that person is invited to attend the issues resolution hearing. I'm not clear whether that was the case or not in this case. Um, Sorry, but, under what? Uh, simply to, to make any... No, no, under, you said under... In the, the case management directions, it's the usual practice. You mean in this, in these proceedings? I'm not clear, because I haven't seen the previous orders. No, we haven't but either. Generally, um, that is you my... You there's a standard form of order that one sometimes sees. Yes. That if somebody wants to complain about a special guardianship assessment, they can come along to the IRH. Well... We, we got ahead of that in this case, didn't we? Because somebody wanted to complain about it in August. Yes. Um, and so here we are. Um, but you, you, you think there may be some order with there some direction? There may be some order invi invited. I'm, I'm unclear as to that. Um, I, it was also to said on behalf of the local authority, the mother's position is, is that he would oppose, and he did oppose, uh, the two stages of this appeal. A part of the considerations for the trial judge uh, were the mother's position the wishes and feelings of the parent. Um, and the, the mother I is quite clear that she has nothing uh, to do now with the appellant in these proceedings. Uh, the local authority, of course, have an interim care order and they are facilitating contact. But, of course, her priority is that her child is safe. Um, and my submissions really uh, endorse what's said on behalf of the local authority, but they focus on the issue of an arguable case and the mother's position. And whilst, uh, my lords, I appreciate, and my lady, that you have considered the issue of delay, um, there would also have been consideration as to the disruption uh, to proceedings. I appreciate that the child is in foster care. My client um, has not attended today because she's a vulnerable woman. She needs a lot of assistance. She has had a pounds assessment in these proceedings. That has shown a number of posit positivities, and as a result, the local authority is seeking to adjourn um, the issues resolution hearing. I imagine they've had regard to the case of Reedy and um, are seeking to undertake those teachings 
Um, one would have expected on the basis that they would hope that there would be uh, rehabilitation at the end of that work. Um, my client, as you will note from the background, has been in and out of hospital. She's doing very well um, to open up uh, what is essentially a, a can of worms as far as the undisputed, uh, sorry, the disputed allegations. Um, one would have to consider how, if how would they be challenged because we have information from a third party um, and who has not been willing to, has asked simply for these matters to be uh, redacted. The case of RIA is very clear as to how the court has to approach these matters. Um, and so my submissions also deal with the fact of this is not an arguable case, even when you take this case at its highest. When you're looking at, um, my lords and my lady, the um, convictions, but also the caution. And that's on the basis that I appreciate, my lords and my lady, you have said when you've looked at the viability assessment, well, a lot of these matters were known. But the viability assessment, by its very nature, considers matters in, in limited detail with the appellant. The special guardianship assessment goes into far more detail. And essentially what was before the um, learner judge uh, and what is before us are various risk assessments that have taken place on information um, that cannot be disputed. We cannot go behind the cautions or the convictions. When one looks at the um, appellant's attitude to matters, that is set out at uh, 136 and 137. And we can see the risk assessment that has essentially been carried out at um, page 136 when they are looking at the time since the convictions, the work that was undertaken um, by probation and the appellant's attitude now. There was a risk assessment taken that took place in my submission as part of this special guardianship um, assessment. And the court will have, the, the learner judge will have looked at that risk assessment because he mentions, albeit not in, in, in considerable detail, but at uh, paragraph 18, considering the special guardianship assessment and the evidence that's before me, he shares the concerns that have been raised. Um, and one will and what also is the evidence that was before him other than the special guardianship assessment? He would have had the, the trial um, bundle before him. The assessment, the, the redacted statement from the local authority for the interim care order hearing also right, well, carries... <coughs> there's no indication that that is anything other than a, a peg to hang the special guardianship assessment on, is there? Um, the statement. The, the statement. Um, yes. I mean, by the time it gets to September, was there any other significant source of other evidence other than the special guardianship assessment? Um, the, the special guardianship assessment, the DBS. The local authority also, in the statement um, in August, also, the, the, I think the social worker was present at hospital when the uh, appellant visited the mother over this issue relating to the will. Um, I appreciate that is a disputed matter. Um, the mother attended you will recall that it's a reference made in the judgment to the mother attending at the school with the will um, that purports um, the uh, appellant to be uh, the, the guardian towards the child. Right. I, I, should, I should have asked, and it's not a question to you, but, um, is whether the redacted statement that was before the judge on the 4th of August has yet been served upon um, the appellant? No. But in that statement, which was before <coughs> the judge, the concern, and I want to be very careful not to uh, misquote, but the concern is, um, of course, as you have been addressed to the mother being very vulnerable and being subject to coercive control. The local authority's risk assessment is based upon the information that we have by way of convictions, but also uh, the, the third party allegations that have been redacted. They um, are concerned that there is a pattern emerging um, and that is part of their risk assessment, as I understand it, in relation to the appellant um, and in relation to previous uh, vulnerable women with young children. And so, uh, my lords and my lady, I ask you to to consider those matters, the arguable case that the, the learned judge, of course, 
looked at it. It's a broad discretion, and he was right, um, I say, on behalf of the mother, to come to the conclusion that he did. Um, that there is continuous referral, and I don't make a big point of this, of the, the appellant being psychological father. Um, there may not be any difference in this or not, but my client's instructions are that he is a, a significant person. Many people um, have relationships with um, other men or women that don't necessarily have parental responsibility. Uh, there may come a time where it's felt by that parent that the partner is unsafe and they cut ties um, and things move on and that person is no longer involved. I appreciate that the appellant is continuing to have supervised contact um, but if there is, again, things may change based on um, the concerns. Yes, we're not concerned about what the situation is today. We're concerned about what it was in September. Um, and the fact of the matter is that between April and August, um, he, wa he wasn't just a parental figure. He was the only parental figure uh, and that was um, for that period of time. So um, it doesn't seem to me that one should rush to um, chip away um, at his prescription, whatever it might be. Um, Yes, my lord. Uh, I simply raised those points that I did on the basis of an argument case. Uh, I don't know if I can speak to that. Just as to paragraph 20 of your skeleton argument, which is at our page 44. I want to ask the same question of you as I asked of Mr. Squire. Um, you say the appeal should simply be dismissed. Yes. So where does that leave the appellant? We say that he has no arguable case and it shouldn't be taken. Um, so in that case, why, why, why do you trouble with paragraph 20? If I could just have a moment. Uh, my instructions are Mr. Drafty Beth, and my understanding is that that would be an alternative approach if the court was not with us um, as to there should be a door left open to a certain yes, extent so for the appellant. And so uh, we had envisaged that he would file a statement. He could be called as a witness. Uh, Who by? By, by the court. Sorry? By the court, potentially. The court doesn't call witnesses. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's my understanding of what the, the learned judge had uh, envisaged. Um, but, yeah. If there was going to be, that would be a matter if you weren't to... Uh, if you were to allow the appeal, but certainly my client's biggest concern is disclosure yeah. of, of papers. Well, I think, we, I think we need to get to the bottom of this, because it clearly struck a chord with the recorder, who may or may not practice in, um, in that area. But I mean, there appeared to be a, a, a wave of response to this application, which is, doesn't need to be a party. He can just turn up, um, and he can file a statement, and he can challenge things, and he can be called. Mm. But I haven't yet understood... What, what mechanism exists for such a thing to, um, to take place? I understand that people uh, sometimes don't like special guardianship assessments and they are told you can come along and indicate a challenge, at which case the, the court will decide what to do with that situation. But we've arrived at that point some way, some way back. Um, and so I, 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 can you help us to as to what would happen at the next hearing. Leave aside the fact that he may be deprived of legal support as a result of the suggestion. How, how does it work? Um, I too have racked my brains on, uh, on what would be uh, the way forward. I, and I understand, <coughs> I, I can accept, that there doesn't seem to be um, a formal route as suggested by the, um, the learned judge, if that was the case. The only option would be he could be permitted to file a statement, but I accept that after he's, he's filed that statement, what would be the mechanism to challenge that? The only thing that I could think of is that the court would call him as a witness. I've had the court call expert witnesses as their witness, where no other party want, felt they could call them. They wanted to cross-examine that expert. Um, so that was the only mechanism my Lord, I could consider. Um, and then he could be called as a witness on his, his own statement. Um, again... This was an application for party status rather than intervener status. Um, but my client's biggest concern is the disclosure of very, very sensitive information of him being, if he was joined as a party, even with limited disclosure, that he should never be permitted to um, sit through any of the other evidence. 
and so that's well, that's, us, us, that's easily achieved. Yes. Thank you. Yes. My lords, my lady. On behalf of the children, and particularly the older child, I want to say right at the outset that uh, clearly Ms. the appellant is a, a significant person in the older child's life. And that was set out in the skeleton on behalf of the children um, from a paragraph. Uh, five to eight uh, about the relationship and the quality of it being good as observed by the Guardian and that it is difficult to know the depth of it because of the older child's special needs um, but I, I don't in any way seek to diminish the fact that this appellant put himself forward and cared for this child successfully without incident. Well, what does the Guardian think in that case about the decision in relation to contact? Well, the hindsight is a wonderful thing. Had matters been dealt with differently in August and the appellant had been invited along to make representations about the fact that he says the special guardianship assessment is wrong and that if uh, notwithstanding that the local authority is going to change the care plan and remove the child into foster care, he should have more contact than one and a half hours a week. Month. A, a month, I beg your, uh, your lordship's pardon. Um, we might not be here because in those circumstances, the appellant would have had his opportunity to have been heard yes. by the judge. But and going back to that, that point, um, we've been told that the Guardian, um, who wasn't able to attend the hearing, but we've been told knew about what was happening. I can't confirm that. Well, I'd, I'd read that um, it was the duty guardian that knew it about was, what was happening, yes. not, not the actual guardian. My understanding was it was a, that it was the duty guardian who was involved because um, the guardian was out of the country, yes. out of the jurisdiction, and that uh, nonetheless, I think he isn't saying that the duty guardian was wrong to say no, that. No, I, I um, wasn't seeking to, to, no. to suggest that, but I'm just not understanding a situation whereby in this day and age local authority can simply remove somebody who's been looked after for four months yes. without, without any notice at all. I wasn't there, but it feels a bit as if it was a knee-jerk reaction to some very frightening news that they'd received. Um, it, that's how it, it appears with the benefit of hindsight, but that's, that's uh, only my uh, uh, submission. Uh, and it is unfortunate, because had the learned judge said, absolutely not, we must get this gentleman over to uh, say that he wants to have more contact or how he's going to challenge what's being said against him. He may never have applied for party status, which is the part of the appeal that the children have an issue with. And the reason the children have an issue with um, party status being given to the appellant is because it, it is partly to do with delay, but it, also, it is also partly to do with <coughs> increasing the complexity of this case, which at the moment has reached a, a turning point in that this mother, who has been described as very vulnerable, and I would respectfully concur with that, is at uh, on the threshold of doing training and being assessed for both her children to come back to her. And so any delay at this stage for another party to be joined, documents to be redacted, Part 25 applications for independent social workers to assess uh, the appellant as a potential carer, when that isn't even his case at the moment, he doesn't put himself in competition to the mother, that increases the complexity, it increases the time scale. Yeah, but I mean, the difficulty I'm, I have with this submission is that this is now three months after the order that we're concerned with, and it was never said that this person shouldn't join the proceedings because the mother is too vulnerable. It was never said that the person shouldn't join the proceedings because it's all too complicated. So how do these arguments relate to the validity of the decision that was taken? Well, I think, I think, I think that's my point about he has the right to be heard and the right to a fair hearing, and he didn't get that. And, I, and the children understand that and accept that. But the children 
on behalf of the children, I would respectfully submit that party status was going too far. Um, it, it would have been better uh, if um, the judge had said on that occasion, no, let's stop, let's wait for him to come to court to say what he wants to say, or listed it in a few days after removal so that he could come and explain his position and seek the contact that he wanted. And then we wouldn't have this issue of whether or not the judge was right to give to refusing party status. Sorry, well, that's a, a quite extreme hypothetical. And I'm not sure it's very helpful, with respect. But what, because um, I, I don't actually understand how somebody just coming along and saying in the courtroom, well, this is what I want to say, what, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, is going to radically change uh, what might be unfair to fair. Well, it how, how does that, but that didn't happen hasn't happened. So saying it might be different if it had happened. Are you proposing that happens now? That there's a hearing at which the father just is invited to come and say, this is what I want to say about information that I don't know and I'm told I can't have? What? I think it For what purpose? I think it would be helpful if the court, uh, whether it's this court or uh, the lower court, were to say, he's a significant person, he has the right to be heard by this court on the issue of contact and to seek a, an opportunity to... So when the outcome of the substantive care proceedings haven't yet been identified, you're saying already his involvement or engagement, his legitimate role is to be confined to contact? I, I think he could challenge the special guardianship assessment in due course at the welfare stage if at that point there are no other options but isn't there's no threshold stage in this case. I mean, surely. I mean, is, was, I, is the threshold not met I, uh, on the basis of incapacity? I don't know, I'm afraid, because I, I, wasn't I wasn't part of those care proceedings. But, sorry, just from your own experience, mm -hmm. when a mother is a, the sole a parent with parental responsibility is admitted to hospital, I would imagine the threshold is... Yes, yes, thank you. I would imagine that. Um, so, from the children's point of view, the quality of the relationship... Right, I still don't understand what you're saying. You're saying, wait, don't do it now. Wait another two months, another three months. Another four months. Well, we were told two months uh, teaching and then further assessment. So, you're saying, wait four months, <coughs> and then a decision can be made as to the extent of... Uh, the appellant's role in the proceedings. Well, of course, I understood that the IRH, the Issues Resolution Hearing, was going to be on the 3rd of January. Well, I know, but we now know there's an agreed yes. consent order. But I imagined that um, the appellant might be invited to the court on the 3rd of January, and at that point, uh, hopefully the court would say, it's right that you should be heard on the issue of contact if you've prepared for this child for four months, which is what should have happened back in August. Um, but it didn't happen. <coughs> then he could be um, heard on that point. And if at that stage, the, at the IRH stage, I, I wasn't aware that there was going to be an assessment and training of, of mother. I know it now, but at the time the skeleton was written, um, I imagined it was going to be the issues resolution hearing with final care plans and um, that the position of the local authority would be clear with regard to the older child, because it doesn't appear that um, the appellant is seeking anything, any any caring role with regard to the younger child. Um, and at that point, if the um, older child, it wasn't an option for that, that child to go back to mother, as far as the local authority were concerned, at that point, the court may say, well, we must look at all the options and invite the local authority to reconsider uh, their position. And if not at that stage, he, his party status could be looked at. But to... to make him a party back in August when there were other ways of getting him uh, the opportunity to have a fair hearing by inviting him to the court uh, to say what the difficulties were about the child being sent. I'm, I'm still struggling with this but um, in his application which was made on the um, 18th of August um, He 
said what he would say if he was invited along. Not a statement. Um, but it contains his request. Sorry, just searching for it. It's at um, page 52. Obviously, there's been water under the bridge since then. Uh, but either with the benefit or without the benefit of legal representation, he would he would come along, and he'd say what he said on the 18th of August. So what's the point in going round that track again? And the, and, the, and the, all the other parties would, would would say, not good enough. I'm not sure that the. Um children would say not good enough at, at, at this stage, knowing what they know now, I think they would say that contact between the appellant and the older child should be looked at. Um, he's a significant person and he may have a role to play in that child's life at some point in the future if things don't work out for mother. Yes. Um, and that is important. So why, why, why does the pr pr principle of, of um, twin track planning not exist in, in this situation. I mean, there, there, there are a number of possibilities. The hoped for one is with mother. Um, the uh, alternative possibility, unless one can simply rule it out, is that the situation uh, reverts to care by a uh, connected person, the appellant, um, or as a complete fallback position that the child spends his childhood in foster care uh, with professional foster carers. Uh, why, why should the court, at the end of the hearing, whenever that is, be deprived of all realistic options? I, I think there was twin track planning by the local authority because they found a significant person for the older child to stay with. It's just that they're assessing... Well, why is twin track planning, as it were, then come to a grinding halt? Because of the safeguarding concerns in August, which I accept the appellant wishes to challenge, and I accept that he wishes to challenge the, the low level of contact that he's been offered. And I accept that he should have a hearing, a right to a fair hearing on that. Uh, but the difficulty with party status for the children is that this is one child we're talking about, the older child, in respect of this appellant. We have a, a younger child who's only 15 months of age. And, to, um, and, and this appellant is only interested in caring for the older child, as I understood it. He's not interested in caring for the older child in competition to mother, so if yeah. things all work out with mother, um, he's not going to be uh, seeking a party status. And yet to give him party status at this stage, uh, to, to what purpose would it serve? Well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a, a hypothetical answer to that, which is that the, the assessment of the mother is unhappily negative, and I fervently hope it isn't, but if it was negative, then at that point, instead of the court saying looking around and saying, well, now do we need to hear from this appellant? And starting from scratch. It could then say, well, actually, the appellant has made his case, and I can see that there's nothing in it, and so therefore foster care. Or the appellant has made his case, and this is a runner. Yes. And it either needs to be approved or looked into more fully. Now, why, assuming that he has no access to things that he's no interest in. What's the problem with that? I have no problem with that. It's only the timing that I have a, an issue with. with um, the, the but as my Lord has said, it, it, a, a decision isn't going to be finally made in relation to the children for several months. Um, and so what's the timing problem? Well, if he gets, uh, if he was to be given party status now, he could apply for an independent social worker assessment and the cost of that would uh, be looked at by the court and the time scale for it would be looked at. Generally it takes several weeks to, to do an independent social worker. Um, well, uh, an, an independent social work report, if it was appropriate, could easily be obtained within the time scale. It, indeed, but is it necessary, is, is my point, at this stage when mother is still uh, arguing for both her children to come home to her? Right. So that's the point. And, and so it's sequential planning. Sequential planning. 
Well, in the sense that if it's necessary to have a 12-week adjournment at the end of mother's training and assessment period, that's the time to build the, the delay in, not at this stage in the new year, um, because he's not putting himself forward in competition with her. Right. Thank so, you. Yes. <coughs> Is there any other matter I may... That, you didn't have any. That was that, That's the point. Um, so I slightly cut you off. I didn't mean to. Uh, so I dealt with the quality of the relationship, the removal uh, point, um, the uh, fact that it, there's no need for him to be a party at this stage because that's not the, the care plan. And if there is to be delay, it doesn't have to be within these proceedings because the impact of that on the younger child um, is unfair in my respectful submission. It, if there's going to be delay, one could postpone that delay until after the younger child has been dealt with if things don't work out for mother uh, and just have the delay for the older child at that point. Um, and uh, as I said, the downside of making the appellant a party um, is that it's it, it just increases the complexity of the matter. It increases the time length of the final hearing. That means there's a delay as to when it could get listed. Um, I know that it's very hard to get lengthy hearings in Lincoln. Whereas uh, if all works out for these two little boys with their mother, um, none of this might be necessary. And that's really the point I make on behalf of the children, that it would be better to proceed hoping that things work out uh, for mother. If they don't, then in respect of the older child only, at that point, the delay may be justified, but not at this stage um, when hopefully things will work out for mother. May I assist you any further? Anything else? Then? Mr. Squire, have you found the order, the case management order, dealing with the uh, special guardianship assessment and containing the a provision that the, anybody who objects to it can come along to the My Lord, hearing. No, um, I, I haven't been able to find those provisions in, in the um, case management order to date, right. unfortunately, and so it, it, I, I certainly accept the point that my learned friend makes that that is a usual provision that goes into such orders um, where there is a direction for a special guardianship assessment, but I can't see that it was built into um, these proceedings. How many case management orders are there? Uh, in these particular proceedings, mm. my lord. Are they in a uh, format that they could be emailed to the court? Uh, Just the order. Certainly, I could email them uh, easily. Could you do that, then, please? Yeah. Yes, of course. Not, not to the party. Not to the party. No, Just no, to because no, no. the party. Just to us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Miss Compton. Um, my lord, um, I agree with the legal approach, which I outlined in my skeleton, which is it's the factors in section ten nine, and then. Additional point of whether it's an eligible case, just for clarity. As per, yeah. Yeah, yeah which, which is outlined. Yeah. Um, as to comments made about um, the the eligible case point, I would just refer uh, my lords and lady to pages 106 and 108 of the viability, which outline the positives and also address yes. um, a discussion <coughs> of uh, the conviction from 2014, or what was thought to be a caution, and the fact that was isolated to the dynamics potentially of that relationship, and that's what the assessor who did who completed the viability thought, having spoken with um, the appellant. Um, I'm asked to raise one factual matter, which was raised by one of my learned friends, I can't remember which, in respect of the mother. Um, I understand that she is still in contact with Mr. Britton, so, uh, with the appellant, certainly those are my instructions, and that she's pregnant with her third child, which may also be relevant to um, the ongoing case planning for this. Um, aside from those matters, is there any particular issue you wanted me to address you on? Right, we're going, no, thank you very much. Um, we're going to rise for a few minutes.
Don't go far away. We'll be back within uh, five or ten minutes. They want the orders now whilst they're out.
Thank you all very much for your respective uh, submissions. Um, given the urgency, we're going to uh, tell you our decision now with uh, a reasoned judgment to follow. Um, our decision is that we will allow the appeal, and Lord Justice Peter Jackson is going to give a very brief outline summary of our reasons and also outline the disposal we propose. Thank you. Um, in the circumstances of this particular case, we will, um, having allowed the appeal, um, direct that the appellant be joined as a party to the um, care proceedings. Uh, the terms of um, his participation um, are to be determined by the family court. Uh, we would suggest at the hearing on the 3rd of January, uh, but we will communicate with the designated family judge, who I think is Judge Clark, um, to ensure that that remains a suitable listing for the purpose which we have in mind. Could the parties please, uh, as soon as they leave court, take steps to notify the court that that date should be held um, until uh, 
the DFJ has been made aware. The topics for that hearing would seem to us to include issues of the extent of disclosure to the appellant, the necessity for any continuing redactions, um, and case management in relation to any further assessment or assessments that might be necessary. Um, it is central to our thinking that uh, by this means there should be no appreciable uh, delay in the proceedings, uh, but instead that the cause of twin track planning should be upheld. Whether that is in relation to the appellant's case as an alternative but not a competitor to the children's mother, or as to any request that he has for participation of a lesser kind by way of contact. Um, the order that we make will, as we understand it, uh, preserve the um, appellant's ability to be legally represented, which we consider will be beneficial to the court uh, and most particularly to the child um, directly concerned. Unless there are any matters that the um, parties need further guidance on, uh, we will attempt to provide them with a judgment during the course of this week so that it will be available to the court um, at the New Year. Is there anything else? No, thank you. Madam. Anything else? From no. No, thank you. While you're all here, would you um, agree a draft proposed order and email it through the same way you did with the case management orders, for which thank you very much. Yes. And could, as I say, could you do that before you leave court? Yes. So that in the event of any sort of, I can't see any reason for a disagreement, but if there is a disagreement, we can do 